Our skin is the largest organ of the body by mass as well as by size. And it's a multifunctional organ. And what that means is it's a set of tissues that work together to carry out a certain set of functions. And in this lecture, we're going to discuss seven different functions of the skin. So let's begin by recalling some basic structure of the skin. So the outermost portion of the skin is the epidermis. And this this portion contains four specialized cells that we're going to discuss in just a moment. We have keratinocytes, we have melanocytes, we have Langerhans cells, and we also have Merkel cells. Now, the middle portion, the middle section of the skin is our dermis, and this contains not only the blood vessels, the arteries and the veins, but also our excretory glands, such as our sebaceous oil gland and the sweat gland. And finally, the lowermost portion portion of the skin is the hypodermis, also known as the subcutaneous layer. And this layer contains not only adipose cells that insulate our body, but also macrophage cells that engulf bacterial cells. So let's begin by discussing function number one of the skin. And this is perhaps the most obvious function of the skin. So the skin creates a physical barrier that protects us from a wide range of harmful things. So recall that inside the epidermis of the skin, we have cells known as keratinocytes. And these cells secrete a protein fiber known as keratin. And keratin not only gives the skin its strength, but it also protects our skin from water. It makes our skin impermeable to water. Now, what else does the skin actually do? Well, within the dermis, we have a network of collagen as well as elastin fibers. And we also have this within the hypodermis, within the subcutaneous layer. And together, our keratin, our collagen, as well as our elastin fibers give the skin strength and elasticity. And this is exactly what allows the skin to resist physical as well as mechanical pressures and forces. So basically, the skin ensures that our internal organs are well protected. For example, if we examine one particular important internal organ, our heart, the heart is not only protected by the sternum bone and the rib cage, it is also actually protected by the layer of skin that exists on top of our sternum and rib cage. Now, <clears throat> aside from actually protecting our internal organs from physical damage, our skin actually protects us from many other things. For example, it protects us from excessive UV radiation. So although our skin actually needs UV radiation to ultimately synthesize vitamin D, a hormone that is used to basically regulate calcium and phosphate ions in our blood, excessive UV radiation is dangerous. Why? Well, recall from physics that UV radiation radiation is a type of electromagnetic wave and it carries more energy than normal visible light waves and that's because it has a slightly higher frequency. So that means when UV radiation, when UV rays actually hit the cells of our skin, they can end up damaging the organelles and the biological molecules such as DNA found inside our skin cells. And that means excessive UV radiation can damage the skin and ultimately lead to things like cancer. And that's exactly why in the epidermis of our skin, we have specialized cells known as melanocytes. And melanocytes release a chemical, a pigment known as melanin. And melanin doesn't only give us our skin color, it also actually absorbs some of that UV radiation which protects us from damaging our skin. Now, not only that, but the skin actually creates a physical barrier that does not allow bacterial cells and viral agents to actually get into our, uh, into our, <clears throat> into our body. 
Uh, the skin also protects us from dehydration and it protects us from a wide variety of different types of chemical agents and harmful chemical things. So if some type of harmful molecule gets onto our skin, there is a very high probability that the skin will not allow that harmful chemical to actually go through the skin and into our organs found inside our body. So this is the function in protection. Now the second function of the skin is that in sensation. So on our skin and in our skin, we basically have a wide variety of different types of sensory or somatic sensory receptors. For example, we have pressure receptors, we have light receptors, we have thermal receptors, and that includes heat and cold receptors. We also have our pain receptors and many other receptor. So what allows me to actually feel it when I pinch my skin is the fact that there is a receptor in that skin that is connected to our nervous system and that allows me to basically sense that pinch, that touch. On top of that, the epidermis contains these specialized cells known as Merkel cells that are involved or believed to be involved in sensation. Now, let's move on to function number three, insulation and thermal regulation. So, recall that the hypodermis, the subcutaneous layer, contains our adipose cells. And what these adipose cells do is they create a layer of insulation. And that basically keeps us cool in the summer days and keeps us warm in the, summer, in the winter nights. Now, what about thermal regulation? Well, recall that our body is in a constant state of homeostasis, so it does what it can to maintain homeostasis. And one of the things that it does is it needs to actually maintain a constant core temperature. So. 36.7 degrees Celsius. If our temperature increases or decreases even slightly, our proteins basically lose their efficiency and cannot function properly. So what our body does is it uses the skin to actually maintain thermal regulation via the process of sweating, perspiration, as well as evaporation and radiation, as we'll see in just a moment. So every exothermic process that takes place in the body, for example, let's say cellular respiration, produces excessive amounts of energy, excessive amounts of heat. And if that heat is not expelled by that body, it will increase the core temperature. And what that means is our body must actually get rid of that heat. And what it does is it takes the heat and it stores that heat in our blood. And as the blood actually travels in these blood vessels in the dermis section of our skin, this blood radiates the heat outward to the outside of our skin. Yeah. Now, we also have these sweat glands, which basically produce our sweat, which consists predominantly of water. And as the water gets onto the surface of our skin, the heat that basically rises and radiates from the moving blood in our blood vessels is used to actually vaporize that water from our skin. And this is an endothermic process. In fact, it's a very endothermic process because water has a high specific heat capacity. And so this is, important, this is an important way by which we regulate the core temperature and homeostasis of our body. So once again, Every exothermic process in the body produces excessive energy that must be dissipated by the body to prevent overheating. What happens is the blood vessels that run in the dermis of our skin it can actually expel some of that energy, some of that heat via the process of radiation. So this energy, this heat simply rises to the top portion of our skin. 
Now, the skin can also expel heat via the endo, uh, endothermic process of evaporation. So, sweating takes place and that rising heat basically vaporizes, evaporates that water and endothermic process and that's how we basically regulate the amount of energy in our body by using our heat. Now, at the same exact time, when it's very cold outside, our skin can actually conserve heat. And how it conserves heat is it basically constricts our blood vessels found in the dermis and that redirects, that shunts the blood away from the skin and that conserves energy because there is very little blood that actually radiates the energy out from our skin. So our skin can not only dissipate that heat, but it can actually be used to store as much heat in the body as possible. Now, function number four, it also functions in excretion as well as secretion. So earlier we mentioned the existence of these sweat glands. So not only can our kidneys actually excrete waste products, ions, and water, but our skin can also be used to actually excrete these molecules and ions. So the sweat glands basically produce sweat which consists of water. It also consists of waste products such as urea as well as our ions such as sodium. And so what these sweat glands do, and these sweat glands are shown in green, they basically produce this substance and secrete and excrete the substance onto the surface via the these sweat pores and then the heat that rises from the blood vessels moving that blood along the dermis is used to actually vaporize that water from our body from the surface of our skin. Now another thing that actually takes place on the skin is something called transepidermal water loss and this is not the same thing as sweating. So actually water can actually diffuse across the upper portion of our skin. So basically water is lost as a result of this process of diffusion that takes place through the skin and this is different than sweating. So once again, the skin is an excretion organ as well as a secretion organ. It can excrete water to the skin surface via diffusion. Waste products such as urea, salt, such as sodium and water can all be excreted via the process of sweating as well as via transepidermal water loss. Now function number five is that in immunity. So earlier we mentioned two types of immune cells. We mentioned Langerhans cells, which are cells found within the epidermis. And Langerhans cells are responsible for interacting with T cells of our immune system. And that basically helps us protect from bacterial agents. On top of that, the hypodermis, the subcutaneous layer of the skin contains macrophages that can actually engulf bacterial cells. Now, function number six is that as, an, uh, as our endocrine gland. So remember, earlier I mentioned that the skin actually needs UV radiation. So certain cells in the epidermis of our skin are responsible for using UV radiation, the energy stored in UV radiation to actually produce something called cholecalciferol. And this is basically an inactive form of vitamin D3. Now, once the skin produces cholecalciferol, it travels into our liver where we basically transform cholecalciferol into calcidiol and then calcidiol travels into our kidney and in the kidneys that calcidiol is transformed into the active form of vitamin D calcitriol. Now, the function of calcitriol is to basically regulate the amount of calcium and phosphate ions found inside our skin. So we need vitamin D to basically regulate the amount of calcium found in our blood as well as the amount of phosphate ions found inside our blood. And this is why the skin is an endocrine organ. It produces this pre-hormone known as our calcifer uh, cholecalciferol. Now, the final function, function number seven of the skin is basically in growth. 
So we know that as the human grows, as the bone grows and the organ grows, the skin must grow along with the uh, everything else inside the human body. And that means the skin must be able to expand. Now, earlier we mentioned that the skin contains protein fibers known as elastin. And it's these elastin fibers that actually give our skin its flexibility and ability to basically expand as the organism grows. And that's exactly why the skin can expand due to these elastin fibers. And therefore, as the organism grows, so does our skin. So these are seven important functions that the skin takes on. On. 